What's up everyone, this is Darius Kalbaczyk, co-founder of NG Poland, JS Poland, Quick Poland, Angular Master.dev and WorkshopFest.dev. Welcome back to the Angular Master Podcast. Today we've got a special guest from Larn Belgium, passionate developer who builds, teach, writes and speaks about Angular. Ladies and gentlemen, Brecht Biet. Hi Brecht, how are you? I'm very good. Thank you very much. How are you? Thank you. I'm great. For those who don't know you yet, please tell us about yourself. So I'm Brecht. I'm a software developer. I uh, used to do AngularJS, started giving training in AngularJS. Then Angular 2, uh, which was the name at the time, happened and um, started giving training in, uh, in that technology as well. I traveled to world. And I think now it's been like six years and a half of uh I've traveled the world doing training, coaching, and I think I've been in more than like a hundred projects. So yeah, that's that's what I'm doing. I'm four fifth of my time I'm freelancing. The other like other three fifth of my time. I um I'm writing blogs, I'm giving training, coaching, helping companies kickstart projects and stuff like that. How did your adventure in programming begin? Yeah, that's a fun uh, question. I uh, I always struggled a bit as a kid. I had ADHD. I was always a rascal. I did all, always stuff I shouldn't be doing. And every year I went to school, I did something else. Like I did electricity, mechanics. I've been a butcher. I've worked in 10 different factories. And then a friend of mine um, also worked at that factory and went to go back to school and he did IT. And I followed them just because I had no direction whatsoever. Uh, whatsoever. And I basically fell in love with programming. I think I already started programming at the age of like 15, 16, building my first websites and stuff like that, but not professionally, of course. And after I finished school, I started doing, um, it was basically everything. I did Photoshop, but also JavaScript, Java.net everything. After a while, I was always pushed to the front end. Like every time I was doing .NET consultancy, they made me do all that JavaScript stuff that nobody wanted to do at the time, because we were talking IE5, IE6 was the browser that we were um, have to do compatibility for. And yeah, so I, I started doing more JavaScript and I followed a course from John Papa on plural sites about single page applications. And I basically fell in love with it. And I was coding like 40 hours a week for my boss at the time and another 30, 40 hours just at my pet project. And yeah, so never stopped doing that. I don't do .NET or any backend anymore. Uh, I do some Node.js, but I'm only doing front ends, uh, and it uh, it grew gradually. So why did you choose Angular? Yeah, so Angular, it wasn't really a choice because, like I said, I was doing .NET and Angular JS. So I was used to TypeScript or like having typings, uh, having dependency injection, and Angular JS had all that. And then in Angular two, it's it became it became even better, right? Because you had TypeScript out of the box. You had uh, the whole dependency injection. It looks so much like a .NET or Java application. Yeah, React was very early age back then. And I also liked doing React, but Angular seemed like the, yeah, the next step to do at the moment. As Angular Mentor, since it's beta stage, how have you seen the framework evolve over the years? And what do you think has contributed to its success? So that's a very interesting question. So for me, the biggest uh, contribution to Angular, its success, is that it's so opinionated and it's so attractive for Java and .NET developers. In Belgium, specifically, most of the big software platforms 
have a .NET or Java backend. And it's not always easy to find front-end developers, so they're looking for full stack. And when you have these concepts like classes and decorators and dependency injection and all that kind of stuff, it feels very similar to the backend technologies. And I used to be a backend uh, developer. I used to be a .NET developer, and I really love the fact that uh, it's completely typed. It's so opinionated. You have the CLI pushing you in this specific uh, direction. I think it also put RxJS on the map, and I'm a really huge RxJS fan. I think uh, Angular had some phases where people were thinking, like, let's move to React uh, or or whatever. But I think that... Um, most of the actual software developers that started doing Angular are still doing Angular at this time. So I think the the base the biggest success there is that it's very opinionated. It pushes you in a direction. When you're doing like a React project, for instance, you can do it like a million ways. And um, when you're doing Angular, you can still do it wrong, right? But it pushes you really into into this direction of object-oriented programming of uh, dependency injection, separation of concerns, and so on. You provided training and coaching to developers. What are the most common challenges or misconceptions you've encountered when teaching Angular best practices? Yeah, so the first thing would be component communication. And here I'm really talking about the keep it simple stupid versus dry principle. So in school, they always teach you uh, to be dry, right? You can never repeat yourself. Repeating yourself is very bad. And I think keep it simple, stupid is more important. I think when you don't repeat yourself, you should not repeat logic. But if you repeat code and because of that repetition, your code becomes way clearer. You can separate everything. It's um, It makes sense. So I'm talking about the whole smart and dumb component thing like passing uh, data from inputs to inputs, like from the top component to the child component and so on. I see people struggling with that. They're always trying to inject everything or add everything into this service and inject this in the, the, like, the lowest child component just so they could access the data, but then they're breaking unidirectional data flow and so on. So that's kind of dangerous. I've also seen a lot of uh, things regarding state management. Um, that's a very big topic out there. But one of the things that I really try to advise developers is like keep the state as low as possible in your component tree. Don't like create this one huge thing where you put all the state in there that maybe shouldn't even be managed. So sometimes people get lost in that and they wind up with this huge store where they put everything in. Um, yeah, and RxJS. And the thing, RxJS is, yeah, it's, it's complex, right? I've trained over 300, 400 people using RxJS and I have to admit, I still struggle with it. I still struggle with my RxJS code that I've written six months ago or code that is written by a colleague or whatever, or just maybe two two weeks ago, me. It's something that is quite complex and I know how it works and I really love it and I love to think reactive and stuff like that. But I think um, that's one of the, the, the hardest challenges that Angular developer face, like how how do commu- how do we communicate between components? How do we manage state and how do we handle this cool but complex thing called RxJS? Because sometimes with RxJS, it feels like we're killing a fly with a bazooka. You have so much power, right? And with big power comes big responsibility, right? That's Uncle Ben from Spider-Man. With your expertise in performance, scalability, and pragmatism. What would be your top tips for companies looking to optimize their large-scale web project using Angular? I would definitely advise everyone to use NX. 
even if you're creating this small pet project where you maybe you want to manage a meal plan or whatever at home, just I still use NX because it fixes everything for you. It fixes the TypeScript pop mappings for you. You have all these integrations with Storybook and so on. Plus, they really innovate. So even if you're not looking at a monorepo, I'd still advise people to to use NX because their tooling is awesome. And it's not just Angular. You can throw any other framework in there that you like. Um, another thing that I want to talk about is like the reusable versus flexible balance. I think that's a very important uh, topic because everybody is trying to create reusable code and that's that's fine. But we don't necessarily want to make those components reusable because the moment when you make them reusable, they will get reused by other developers. Like maybe you don't want it to be reused. So I would always like to keep that balance between reusability and flexibility because when you're making a component reusable, it's not flexible anymore. Let's say that you have a product component, for instance, and you have a web shop and an admin uh, panel. That product component could be shared between the admin panel and the actual web shop. But if a PM later says, like, I also, I also want to see the stock inside of that uh, component, and as a developer you add it, then out of a sudden it's also added in the web shop where you don't want people to see the stock. So in that case, it could be a good idea to just, like, copy-paste it if it doesn't hold that much complexity, copy paste it and let it live on its own. That's flexibility. So it's it's always a balance. It's hard to find a balance between reusability and flexibility. So I always start with flexibility and then when it has to be reused, you can make the decision like do we want to have a, do we want to give it a life on its own or do we want to reuse it completely or make it parameterizable? And for performance, learning the difference between the inner zone and outer zone in Angular is something that is very important. Um, a lot of people don't know what the inner and the outer zone is, but everybody is adding the on push strategy on their components. But it's not so much about which components get detected for changes. It's more about how many times change detection is actually triggered. So if you would, for instance, have a timer that's running every 100 milliseconds to draw something in the canvas, for instance, and you're running that in the regular angular zone, yeah, you're going to have change detection running on all your components every 100 milliseconds. And that's a performance bottleneck. You're listening, Angular Master Podcast. Listen, code, repeat. Everything you need to know to become an Angular super developer. By the way, what do you think about Angular's latest features? I love where they're going, but I'm also a little bit concerned about the identity of Angular. So I love the standalone components. I've been using them since uh, version 14. I love signals for state management. I have created this own thing called observable state where I abstract the RxJS uh, problems in. And I've started refactoring that to signals as well. It's awesome. There's a lot of cool things happening. But I'm 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 just hoping that for for the developers I was talking about, like the Java, the, the .NET developers, they don't wind up with a completely new framework. Like I hope they they still keep their their current um APIs are still, I know that they want to make RxJS optional in a way. Um, and I think that's a good thing. But yeah, I'm a little bit skeptical if we aren't changing too much. But it's, it's, it's not an opinion, it's more of a concern. How do you ensure efficient performance in Angular applications? I would use the push strategy on all child components unless they have inputs that contain objects with a prototype. Like for instance, if they if we pass a form control 
to an input. I'm not sure why you want to do that, but some developers do. That means that if something happens in that form control, the change detection of the component that is using on push will not uh, get triggered. So I only try to use it on components that have immutable data structures. I don't use it on my smart components because, yeah, I mean the parent components, because those parent components, they well, they will be marked for check like all the time. So change detection will happen anyway. And the moment where they actually are doing an, an, an asynchronous call, then change detection will break. And then if we don't know how change detection works, people will use the change detector ref marked for check or even a set timeout. And your application gets filled with all these manual mark for checks. So I would be careful with the unpush. Like I said before, running things in the outer zone can be a major performance um, optimization and always the track by thing. So I had to give a training a few years at a, at a company here in Belgium. And at lunch, at the lunch break, they pulled me in this room and they said like, hey, do you have five minutes to look at our performance issue? They had this huge list. And when they started scrolling, like the browser just froze. And I said like, this is, uh, yeah, you're using an NG4 for sure, right? But did you use a track by? And they didn't know what it was. So they just added like track by, which was one line and the problem was solved. So if you always use a track by, even if you're just tracking by the index, um, it, it could help us avoid a lot of a lot of performance issues. Can you discuss the importance of modularization in Angular and how it can help organize code? First of all, modules and ng modules i mean it's the same thing right so we we have ecmascript modules and they're there to just organize your code uh um, ng modules will be gone or will be less used in the in the future but we can still achieve the same thing which is javascript and and the es modules i think it's important to keep your stuff inside of your library like If you're having components that you don't want to be reused, don't expose them. Like, never expose them. Keep your barrel file of your library as small as possible. And now I'm talking about the barrel file of an NX uh, project, but it could be the same for Angular, right? In that index.ts file, you only expose what you need. So if you have a lazy loaded module, you should only expose your lazy loaded module. So that's the only thing that you should expose. You should not expose like your services or your components. So keep it there. Keep it in one single barrel file so that it's encapsulated within that module. It's it's all about scalability, code reuse, encapsulation, flexibility versus reusability. So definitely like working in a modular way will will make refactoring a breeze. Like when I'm in a in a code base, like a workspace with 400, 500 projects in there, in a monorepo, on a day-to-day basis, we're constantly moving things around. And it makes sense. And we shouldn't be scared of it because when you have a decent architecture and you just don't make everything reusable, doesn't mean that you don't have to write reusable code, but you don't make it reusable, you can just like move things around when it makes sense. For instance, if you have an address component and you want to reuse that address component in in another feature in your code base, you could say, okay, I'm going to reuse it. So I'm just extracting it to yet a new UI library that is being consumed by both of these feature lips. So if you're following the NX guidelines, you you can definitely come up with this architecture which is very modular and where you can just like move things around all the time. But it has to make sense. What are the benefits of using lazy loading in Angular applications and how can developers implement it? Yeah, so the benefits are you you will wind up with a smaller initial bundle size. That's one of the benefits. But the, ben- the biggest benefit for me is that it forces you to think about this sandboxed environment, like you're you're lazy loading 
a chunk. You're lazy loading a piece of your software, which could which could be a, a separate software if you're using module federation or or whatever. It forces you to think about like this this should be inside of this sandboxed environment there, and we just we can just lazy load it on demand. How to implement it is yeah, it's basically being done for you if you're using NX, but with the new standalone components, it's just importing routes. So it's just importing an array of routes which will load uh, a module. So basically, it's it's done for us right out of the box. We don't have to... It's not complicated. It used to be complicated, like an Angular 2. I remember struggling with it, like when they introduced lazy loading. But right now, it's it's just a breeze to to do that. And if you're using NX, you can just add the dash dash routing, dash dash lazy parameters on your CLI command and everything will just work out of the box. I also I also believe that we should do it by default, like using the lazy loading. For me, everything is lazy loaded in, in my applications. Maybe if there's for instance, a chat box that should be shown in different parts of the application, maybe then I wouldn't lazy load it, but normally I would definitely lazy load it. How can Angular developers leverage the power of RxJS observables and to manage application state and handle asynchronous tasks? I really love this question. And it's a question that lies very dear to my heart uh, because I had a lot of discussions, I met a lot of very interesting people where I could spar with these ideas. I've started using frameworks like NGRX um, and stuff like that. But after a while, at, for me personally, my code base became really bloated with, with boilerplate and it was very hard to see what was going on. And then I, I started to think like, why can't we just use behavior subjects? And um, a behavior subject is basically a subject that replays the latest value and always has the initial value. So a behavior subject is the only subject in RxJS that has a dot value property where we can synchronously get the value from. Now, the thing about these behavior subjects is they they tend to wander around in your code base. Like you can have like a gazillion behavior subjects just lying around and it can be it can be hard as well. So for my current uh, client, I started to to develop this thing called observable state. And what, what my goal there was, it was to use the power of a behavior subject, but do it in an opinionated way. Because that's what these frameworks are trying to do, right? They're trying to do this in an opinionated way where you don't have to worry about memory leaks and you don't have to worry about multicasting in RxJS. And you don't have to worry about all these different things called schedulers and so on. <clears throat> and basically, we wind up with a 100-line a uh, code file that does everything for us. It um, You can connect observables to it. You can cherry pick different pieces of state. It's completely synchronous. You have a snapshot all the time because when people are talking about RxJS, they're talking about you have to be reactive. You always have to do reactive programming. And I mean, it makes sense when your data flows to your component. But when you're trying to save a user, for instance, you want the current user you do not want to subscribe to some observable and then use the take one operator to to get the latest value. That doesn't make sense. You want the snapshot, right? So, and this is where we're going with signals as well. We want to go to synchronous states. It prepares us for signals. So the principles that you are doing by using that small piece of code that I'm not even going to open source in an NPM package because I don't consider it a good practice to just install whatever you find. Own it yourself. It's 100 lines of code. It's not that much, and it will prepare you for signals, which is also synchronous state. So really love RxJS, but if I'm completely honest, it's complex. It's hard. There's so much you need to know. Like To be completely honest, I have... I have I hadn't heard about the queue scheduler 
till last month. And this is what the observable state needs because a behavior subject that is updating state within it, in that specific behavior subject, yeah, it, it can get wrong quite fast. And I think that's also the reason why these state management frameworks are very popular because they they try to hide all that complexity that RxJS has to offer you. Like I said, it's it's an awesome technology, but sometimes it's, it feels like killing a fly with a bazooka. I mean, it, it makes way more sense to reason about state if it's synchronous and then still leverage RxJS to do like a deep bounce time or, or a switch map, something like that, so that you cannot just do a regular promises. Um, but for state, I think it's very nice that that signals are coming and um, that it gets simplified a lot by that. In what ways can Angular developers optimize change detection to improve application performance? So change detection is a very important aspect in Angular right now. I was coaching a client of mine six months ago in change detection and then I realized I actually didn't know change detection myself like I should have known it and I started digging into it more and more and giving some training inside of that company and I I wound up uh, writing a book about Angular change detection so I had to actually reverse engineer the source code because there is so little information on the web about what's actually happening behind the scenes so how do we optimize performance with change detection? Get to know change detection. I actually have a, a five-minute video on YouTube where I just explain everything you need to know about change detection in five minutes. Um, yeah, basically, it will tell you like these. there are these two zones and there's this one zone where every event that happens inside of that zone is constantly triggering change detection and you have a zone that is built specifically to not trigger change detection. And then, yeah, you can you can optimize change detection. For instance, if you, if you have this drag and drop, right? The moment you start dragging, it's gonna fire mouse move events like 10 times a second. So if you're running that in the inner zone, you're gonna trigger change detection in the um, every 10 milliseconds. So what I'm trying to say there is if we're doing a drag and drop, when we click, we need to trigger change detection. But when we move around, we don't need to trigger change detection because we're redrawing with vanilla JS. And then when we release again, we need to um, trigger change detection again. So that means that we only trigger change detection twice instead of 100 times. So that kind of stuff is um, very interesting. You can also detach from the change detector. Um, But in general, I would just be cautious when using third-party libraries. For instance, I had a colleague who installed a perfect scroll bar a few years ago in in a project. And that perfect scroll bar was an NGX version of the perfect scroll bar. And they didn't really paid that much attention to performance. So every time we scrolled in our application, it was like firing change detection like 30 times a second. And the application became slow and nobody knew because we just installed something that was like behind the scenes constantly triggering change detection. So I think when it comes to performance in Angular, change detection might be the biggest thing instead of the track by thing that we already mentioned. I would just say, get to know it. Like the five minute video is very, very simplified. It's it's not rocket science. Um, and and just be aware of the inner zone, which is the default zone, which is constantly triggering change detection on every single event. What is your YouTube channel name? Uh, it's Simplified Courses. I only started recently. I think I have like five uh, five videos. I'm um, really struggling with time lately. I'm trying to do too much in way too little time. 
But so that video is something that I'm actually pretty proud of because it's a very hard concept to summarize in, in five minutes. But yeah, if you just look at simplified courses on YouTube, you should be able to define it. What are some useful tips for managing forms in Angular and how can developers ensure better user experience with form validation? To be honest, I've been struggling with forms since Angular 2. Well, actually since Angular JS, but also in Angular 2, I've always been struggling with forms. I, in every company uh, I started, I had to implement some kind of form abstraction because there was so many redundancy. And then for some reason, like the the community kept telling us, yeah, you have to use reactive forms. And after a while, you start believing it because, you know, reactive forms are easier to test. Right now, I, I use um, integration tests for to test my forms, so that doesn't really uh, matter anymore. But I saw an interesting talk about template-driven forms at ng-com from Ward Bell, and then a new uh, talk about how to do form validations in template-driven forms. I'm still working with reactive forms, but I'm making the switch. I already kind of made the switch in my in my mind, but I have not introduced it on big projects yet. But I can definitely, you will be able to explain it much better than I am. You just have to look at Ward Balf, the latest two talks. They're really nice. So what he actually does in the in the last talk is he doesn't treat a form as something that has to be validated, but there's a model behind that form. And that's the thing you want to validate because you might want to validate that on the back end as well. And he uses this technology called FAST where he creates these suites of assertions to validate against that model. And then he he creates some kind of component or directive, I don't really remember, that just translates that test suite to your form. So there's zero boilerplate code. And you don't have to look inside of your templates or forms like what is validated and how. You have this specific model for that. I, th- I thought it was very interesting. Definitely check it out. But yeah, so I've I've been struggling with forms since since ever. How can developers use Angular CLI effectively to streamline their development workflow? Uh, that's a nice question. Um, so when Angular two got released, there wasn't really a CLI, and then after a while, there was a CLI, but nobody used it. And then it was optional and somehow, I don't know when it happened, but now everybody is using the CLI because we do not want to create our own Webpack configuration for, for Angular. I've been, I've been doing that for years in AngularJS actually and in Angular creating all these Webpack configurations and then code coverage with Istanbul and all these different technologies that I had to work together. The CLI just does that for you. I don't use the Angular CLI. I use NX, but basically NX uses the Angular CLI. And as my two cents, I would say as a best practice to always use commands to generate. Don't start to create or copy paste code. Um, Just create it with the CLI. Because if you do that, you will wind up with a way more consistent code base because your code will always be at the same place. You will have the same configurations. You will have the the prefix. You will not forget the prefix of your component selector and so on. Yeah, I would definitely do that. And when you're using NX, I would also configure the generators part in the NX JSON. So the generators part, there you can put default configs for components, for directives, for services, and so on. So if you're saying like standalone true and you're generating a component, then it's going to be a standalone component. And when you have a a code base where you do uh, standalone components, you probably want all your components to be standalone if you have a new code base at least or for new code. If you don't want to generate unit tests, but you rather want to test your components with Cypress, for instance, you put test to false. So once you configure those 
configuration parts in the generators part of NX. Um, basically, your commands become really short. And it's very nice to just create the stuff that you don't want to write yourself automatically. Have you used ChatGPT to help develop an Angular application? Um, I have been playing with ChatGPT for a while. For coding, it's just basically my, my rubber duck. So I ask it some stuff and then it basically gives me an answer. It's not always right. But I really love the technology. And I, I've written an article a few months ago where I actually wrote the snake game with ChatGPT. And it was actually a very pleasant experience because first I told him to to write me snake and he gave me something really bad. Like it didn't work at all. It was lacking all these features. And then I just told him like, no, I want you to write me the most complete snake game there is. And he did. And I copy pasted the code and it didn't work. And it didn't work because he forgot to add some imports there. Some imports of dependencies. So I asked him like, again, I'm getting this error. What's this? And he told me like, you forgot to add an import. And I told him like, I didn't forget anything like you did. Is there anything else you forgot? And he actually forgot two more imports and he told me about it. Like, oh yeah, I uh, I forgot two more imports and the game worked. It just works. And I was very, very surprised. I said like, okay, but you're putting all this, this, this code inside of this component. I mean, do you think that's a good idea architectural wise? It told me, you know, could be better. Let's extract the game logic into a different service. And he did that, and that that worked as well. And then I started to push him a little bit more, like, how do we optimize this for performance? And he was talking about uh, animation frames and some other stuff I don't really remember. I told him, like, do you um, have anything change detection related, maybe? And then he 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 told me to use the on-push strategy on my components, so it got better. And then the last step was the human step, where I actually run the entire snake game in the outer zone because it was just a canvas that got redrawn every 100 uh, milliseconds. So that was very nice. But I have I, I'm not using um, Copilot. I think uh, I should. But there are so many things that I want to check, like the auto GPT thing. Um, I do think like the chat GPT is going to be like a major, major revolution. And I think, I don't think we should be worried about our jobs. I think we will just have to learn to use these, these AIs and they will help us to, to, to create awesome codes faster. And also, like, if you're asking something like how, for instance, would you do content projection in Angular and how do you pass a template to that, like that stuff that you have to find in the in the documentation, it's nice to just ask it to the, to the AI and see an instant, like, okay, let's try this. And to be, to be fair, the results... It's not always correct. Sometimes it just tries to make you happy, but it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't work. But I mean, in in a few years, it's gonna be gonna be a different landscape. I think. What are the advantages of writing unit tests and end-to-end -end tests for Angular applications, and how can developers incorporate them into their projects? I used to write unit tests for everything. And I mean, I'm not proud of it, but I was I was a person at a certain time in my career that, that wanted to have like this 100% test coverage thing because maybe I'm a bit uh, autistic. I don't know. It it uh, it made me feel good in, in my mind. But it, uh, it turned out that actually when writing unit tests for everything, I spent... I spent more time writing unit tests than writing the code, but it was not just that. I spent more time maintaining those unit tests and rewriting those unit tests. Every time a dependency got added or removed or replaced, I had to, like, everything was broken again. So we started rewriting those tests 
to to actually make them pass. And if you're doing that for your own code, you remember what you were trying to do. But if somebody else has written those code and you constantly have to make other people their test pass, you, you might not see what their intention of that test was. And so you wind up with um, with with bad tests. Um, I think it was like three years ago, I started freelancing for this company called Rosa. And they had introduced this thing called the honeycomb principle which basically tells you you write a little bit of unit tests you like you write a lot of integration tests and you write a little bit of end-to-end tests again so for the end-to-end tests you're testing the happy part so when you deploy your application like can i still log in can i still book an appointment can i still do like these basic things and when you're having these very complex algorithms or stuff that you would have tested TDD before, like first write your test and then start implementing the actual logic. We would still write unit tests for that. But for our components, we would write Cypress tests in combination with Storybook. So we use Storybook to sandbox the environment of the components. And then we write Cypress tests for that. And I was very skeptical. I said like, this... This will not this will not work. I mean, I'm so used to writing these unit tests. Why would we do these Cypress tests? They're gonna be slow, they're gonna be slow to write, they're gonna be slow to execute, and so on. And it turned out that that wasn't true at all. It was actually very fast to write them. It was slower to run than than the unit test, but it was still way faster than than an than an end-to-end test. But after a few months, I started forgetting about the time that I ever had to rewrite tests. I never had to rewrite tests again because I wasn't testing the implementation. I was testing if it actually worked. My tests became way smaller and I could refactor a component to React component and it would still like test that component completely. So since then, I've, I've, I haven't looked back actually. And now for my components, I always use Cypress in combination with Storybook. And if you have a smart component, then you have to think about what is the actual thing that I'm trying to test? What is this component doing? We're not going to talk about visualizing data because that's like the dumb components that it uses where you can test that completely. But like the orchestration part, we, we want to test some happy parts in there and the orchestration. And then in their dumb components, we want to sandbox that component again in a story and write Cypress tests on that as well. And to be honest, it works really, really well. I really love this approach. And I don't think there are a lot of developers out there that can actually say they love writing tests. I mean, it's something that we need to do, but we don't always want to do. And when you're spending more time writing your unit tests than actually coding or more tests maintaining those, uh, more uh, time maintaining those tests, yeah, then it becomes demotivating. So I would definitely watch out for that because there's nothing worse than a developer that is not motivated anymore. And every company has their budget. Every company has their budget for features and every company has their budget for tests, right? So make that budget count. If you can spend like four hours a day or three hours a day writing tests, make sure that these tests, they give you return of investments. And that's what this honeycomb principle really does, in my opinion. Can you discuss the role of dependency injection in Angular and why it's considered a best practice? So dependency injection in general, I think it's uh, originated from, from unit tests where we can just mock dependencies away. I think that's one of the, the first things why, why people started using dependency injection and also to decouple stuff, right? So you don't need to know the dependencies of your dependencies when you're instantiating something. So that principle alone is kind of nice. I think it's clean, but especially when developing Angular applications, dependency injection is like the most awesome feature of the entire framework, in my opinion. And not... The fact that you can just abstract things away, 
But if you're providing something in root, it becomes a singleton, right? You, you can have access in, in the entire application. But the cool thing is you can also use dependency injection on modules or components. And when that component where you provide a dependency to gets destroyed, you know, that dependency will get destroyed as well. So a lot of developers don't know that you can actually implement the ng on destroy lifecycle hook on an Angular injectable. And it's very powerful. For instance, let's say that we have this wizard with five steps. And in that wizard, so we have a wizard component. And that wizard component has a wizard state or a wizard's view model or whatever you want to call it. Like you, you have this wizard service. You could use that wizard service to, to communicate between all the different steps. These different steps are different routes with different components, and they all need that wizard service. So we can add state in that wizard service. There could be like, there's five steps. So let's say that there are five different form groups in that wizard service. When we go back from step four to step three, we will still have all the data because it's in a wizard service. And the moment we navigate away from that wizard, the wizard component gets destroyed. So its wizard service also gets destroyed. And we get that for free. We don't have to manage this. We don't have to invalidate that piece of state. So using dependency injection on components can be very powerful. Also, if you're if you're thinking about redundancy. So let's say that we have a user detail and a user add component and 90% of the code in there is is the same. So we cannot just use any service and provide it in root because then the user detail and user add will share state and we don't want that. So we provide it on each of these two components and we can just reuse or we can extract logic inside of those injectables and use composition over inheritance to to avoid redundancy, but we still have different instances that gets that automatically get cleaned up for us. So I really love it. I love it for for state management. I love it for um, communication between different components when there's like a router outlet between these components. I think it's the the biggest fe- feature Angular has to offer. And I think that's also why it's so attractive for, for backend developers like .NETers or, or Java developers. How do Angular developers benefit from following a consistent coding style like the Angular style guide? So I think the, the goal there is consistency. Guidelines are a matter of perception, right? So if, if my... I have a best practices training and all of those best practices are personal experiences. There is no no such thing as a good guideline or a good best practice. It's of course there are some of them that you cannot that we cannot ignore, but basically it's something that we choose as a team. And I think it's important that in a company the guidelines are being chosen by that team. It gives you the opportunity to debate with your colleagues. And what I usually do is I I create this guidelines MD file and I just put it inside a repo. I don't mostly even uh, use a different repo. I just put it inside the repo together with the code and people can create pull requests for it. They're not gonna, so nobody can diverge from the guidelines unless they have a valid reason, but they're, they're the owner of those guidelines. And when they're creating a pull request to update those guidelines, then the entire team should be able to to say something about it. They can debate. And yeah, it's uh, since it's so close to the code, it will probably get read too. Because if we're going to add it to Confluence or whatever, you know, people rarely read the guidelines. And when you're in your IDE and you're thinking like, should have, should I use um, an underscore prefix for a private variable or not? You can just go to the guidelines. Oh no, we don't do that, for instance, or we do whatever. Because I think guidelines 
everybody has opinions, right? And ideas can be very um, biased, to say the least. And everybody is right, you know? But when you have a debate about it and you put it in the guidelines, you can let it go. And you just follow the guidelines because it's, it gives you consistency. And that's basically the most important thing, like having a consistent code base because it's 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 an ease, an ease of mind and it just results in a better quality of code. What are the key factors to consider when choosing tripart libraries and tools for Angular projects? That's another great question. I think every dependency that you install is like creating a tiny marriage. And it's the same, it's the same with, uh, with dependencies because when you install them, especially when you install a dependency that has a dependency to a specific Angular version, you can get caught quite uh, quickly. I would avoid to use these NGX kind of dependencies if you can, unless you know, they're really battle tested. And, you know, like, for instance, I don't use NGRX myself, but I'm pretty confident that when they go to a new Angular version, NGRX is going to move like right along with it. So it's not dangerous to add stuff like that, but there are so many NGX dependencies out there. So if you want to start with open source and there is this thing, let's let's say full calendar, for instance, full calendar is a 12 year old or 14 year old, I think now, um, JavaScript library that just gives you the, the basic calendar that we all know. Let's say that, that you want to become an open source developer and you want to have quick traction, you just create your NGX full calendar and you just create a wrapper around that and you ship it and people start using it and that's awesome. But that doesn't really mean that the quality of that wrapper library is that good. So I would always check GitHub stars. I would check the open issues. I would check how long it exists. I would check in the in the history how long it's it took to go to new Angular versions and so on. You could check the weekly downloads um but i'm not a, i'm not a fan of reinventing the wheel again but sometimes it makes sense like for instance i'm, I'm working for dhl aviation now and one of their so so the aviation part is the the airplane business right and one of their core components is a table they have to visualize so much data uh, on one screen and they have a lot of specific things there like collapsible rows, reordering, stuff like that. And everything that you do in that table, they want to keep that as a state and they want to persist it on the back end and so on. It's it's crazy. So for that, we, we looked at different alternatives and we wind up writing it ourselves. It took us like two weeks or something to write it ourselves and now we own it. We own the quality, we own the testing, we own the features, we own the best practices, we own everything. And in some cases, that makes sense. If you're creating your meal planner application, don't start writing your own table. Use what, what whatever's out there, right? It, it, it really depends on, on what, you, what you're developing. But I would be cautious to not just install a dependency because... It can it can get tricky. I have I'm, and I'm not gonna name any any dependencies, but I had two kind of very well used and famous libraries, and I had problems with migrating to Angular 15.x because there was something that wasn't up to date, and then it makes you wonder like. Do you have any idea how much dependencies there are in my node modules folder? Like how does that net how does that that not break sooner? So I would just say if you have to use it, use it of course, but always check the GitHub, always check the NPM uh, weekly downloads. And you know what what can also help is try it in StackBlitz. You know, just try try that specific dependency in StackBlitz. I had I've, I have had dependencies with a lot of stars that I couldn't even install in StackBlitz because, yeah, for some reason it broke. And then, 
you know, maybe it's um, it's a good idea to look for an alternative that has more credibility. What advice would you give to Angular developers who want to stay up to date with the latest best practices and trends in the Angular ecosystem? So the first thing that I would do, and this is the cheapest thing that you can do, which will only take you like 10 minutes a day, is create a Twitter account. And you could follow the people that I follow. It's only like 230 people or something. And every single person that I follow has contributed uh, to to my knowledge in a way. And every every day just go to your feet and they will it's basically a push mechanism right they will just push information in your head i mean you will know that there's this thing called signals that are coming and you will know that there are um functional components on the way or that they're at least debating about that so just get a twitter account follow the the feeds daily make a, a list of blogs if you're a reader if you're not a reader, you can you can go to YouTube channels uh, to avoid the like tutorial hell. I've I've been working on this uh, best practices training. I've I'm gonna do it online, um, like live online, the 11th of May. But my plan is to create an actual product course uh, for that as well. In the future, also get it on site. So. But basically, it's like seven years of experience. You cannot experience. I mean, you need time for that. Um, I've thrown it in this one thing. It will not help you keep up to date, of course, although it gets updated with the latest and greatest. So I think it's like six months old now, and I've been constantly updating it. There's this new chapter about signals coming soon. But we're not here to, uh, to advertise my training. So I would say... Just Twitter is the cheapest thing. That's just super cheap. And people will not like post pictures of their spaghetti plates or whatever. They will like they will and they will tell you interesting stuff. And then most of the time it's a link to a blog. If you like that blog, you can bookmark it or subscribe. And then um yeah, most of the time you can just get meals. Uh, about articles that can be interesting and you don't have to start looking for interesting information the information will come to you and another thing that i would really advise for beginner people is create a pet project like create something that you love after my first divorce yes i've been divorced twice but after my first divorce, I, I really had financial trouble. I um, I wasn't working that long yet. I had to pay rent by myself. And so I created this application that visualizes where my money went. Like how much do you pay on rent? How much do you pay on food? How much do you pay on going out and, and stuff like that? And that was the same time I followed the Jump Papa course from Pluralsight. So I could use all these awesome technologies. It used to be Knockout JS with semi JS for routing. And now we had Amplify and, and stuff like the whole JavaScript fatigue. But it was awesome. I could like use this project to to do something that helped me. I would advise not to think about making it payable. Because when you're making it payable, you're creating this burden on your chest. And you have to start performing and you're not a developer anymore, but you're a marketeer, you're a salesman, you're all, you can have, you have to wear all these different hats with all these different responsibilities and the fun can get sucked out of your pet project quite fast. So own that pet project, feed it, add awesome features. If you see this new thing called signals, why don't you refactor one of your components to, to use the signals approach, you will have learned a lot. You will have a lot of questions that you can ask to the right people. Um, yeah, so that's my two cents. And now, it's time for the non-tech questions. Anything can happen here. What kind of person is Brecht and how do you see yourself? 
the, the the person I am is I try to help people. And the reason I knew that I tried to help people is I struggled a lot with love. I was at this bonfire and a friend told me like, you don't look happy anymore. You should look up like this guy called Tony Robbins. And he's basically this, this self-taught guru that helps people achieve happiness. And um, the thing about being happy is ha- having a fulfilled life. That's, that's art. Like having a, a beautiful girlfriend or money or whatever, there's a science to that, but being happy, that's, that's really art. And by, by doing these notes that he told me to do in, in his seminars, I, the thing that makes me happy is helping people. And I think that's why I started giving training in Angular Jazz and Angular as well. But then COVID happened and then stuff got pretty blurry. But um, so I learned that like when, when, I, when I help people, it makes me happy. So it's a motivation to do that. So a few times a week, I also take time to, to help people. So, so just reach out. I help, I help them for free, like developers that are struggling because yeah, I mean, trainings aren't always cheap. And for, for some people, it's very hard to, to, to get that money. So I don't want to give them discounts. I rather just like coach them for free. You know, have a have an honest conversation, and we can just uh, spar. So I really love doing that with the limited time I have, of course. Um, so yeah, that's basically uh, who I am. I, I I love to to work out, but also because I need it mentally to uh, to work out. And for the rest, I love my job. I love coaching. I love training, and I love creating content and. The content part can get tricky sometimes because, yeah, sometimes it feels like there's a lot that is being expected of you and the simplified courses thing is only like six, seven months old. So the audience is pretty small. So it's sometimes hard to find motivation to write that content because you don't always know when it's going to be read or seen. But... uh, yeah, basically, um, just trying uh, trying to be me. Do you have some hints for us regarding self organization? Yes, I I do. So for me personally, I need to go to the gym like four times a week to have this mental uh, health uh, going on. For organization, in the beginning of the day, I always make a to do list. I know like most people can just do that in their head by just putting that to-do list there. It takes you 10 minutes and there's not a single moment in that day where you say like, hmm, what should I work on now? Because you just take at that list like, okay, I still have to do this. There's always enough on your list. There's always enough on your plate. And when you're having a productive day, when you're having a day that you said like, today I really did a ton, that's the best motivation that you can have for the next day. And I've been in I've been in projects where we had to work we have to wait for for feature requests and stuff like that. And sometimes there was not that much work going on. And even though you still got paid, you just sat there like waiting for work. That's the the worst thing that can happen for for your motivation. So if you have that to do lists, even if there's not a lot of work and your employer or your client comes to you and tells you like, hey, what you're working on? Yeah, there's not much I can do there, but here I have this list where I uh, I looked at the, the performance of this specific component today, for instance. So always have that list. What's about your work-life balance? Do you have some hints for us? That's um, That's the most tricky thing you can ask because... I'm not always, I'm not only trying to be an engineer, I'm also trying to be this solopreneur. I'm still early stage in in that thing, but it does take a lot of time already. So finding the balance is very hard. And one of the, the biggest pointers I can give is if you're spending time with your family, spend time with your family, like ditch that phone, uh, if you have dinner, sit on the table together, have a conversation, and don't 
be busy with work. And at the same time, when you're busy with work, you know, tell your children to not come bug you because you lose your attention and then you're you're less productive. So I think the most important thing there is to really have this um this separation of these two different things like don't do two times at two things at the same time because you're not going to perform well in it and if you're doing one thing at the same time yeah you can ace it your children going to be way more happy if they see you they're going to be more fulfilled you're going to be more fulfilled your 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 next day is going to be more fulfilled you're going to be more productive and so on and uh like i said going going to the gym it's like People think it costs you energy, but it actually gives you a lot of energy for free. What I also try to do in the morning, and that's that's maybe a, a silly comment, but I always turn the shower to like ice cold for like one minute or something. And it wakes me up, but it also prepares me for stuff I don't like to do because I don't like to take a, a cold shower at all. Um but it's it it gives you the attitude to say like okay I'm gonna I'm just gonna do that I'm just gonna if I'm doing this right now then this annoying unit test that I still need to write I'm just gonna do that and not gonna sob about it, um, so yeah basically that but still to be honest I'm I'm still looking for for answers to uh, to get work balance um, very good to. To be honest, for me, it's sometimes easy as well because my girlfriend does not live with me yet and she also has two children. So when my children are in bed, I'm alone anyway and I have time to write articles or or create content. So um, yeah, in in that case, I think I'm, I'm lucky between quotes, but it's still a struggle. A book? you would recommend to our listeners? So everybody can learn a skill or everybody can become good at something and tons of resources uh, out there. But yeah, I would would recommend the book The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck um, because it made an impact. It's not really learning something. It's like learning how to deal with situations and how to not get heated discussions if you're talking with a colleague whether you should use angular or react you know just letting the things go um but yeah like like books i think there's so much awesome content out there if you're interested you can always have a, a look at the change detection simplified ebook but um and there's no one single book so if there's one single book that i would have to recommend it wouldn't be a technical book because there are so many technical books out there and most of the time the blog articles that you read are the same quality or even better than than a technical book it's not always the case but there's so much content out there so if you cause like if you fix like the root cause like not giving fucks about everything all the time that can really help in uh, in everyone's career and and the thing is it's it's a pleasant book to read the guy i think it's mark manson that wrote it uh he's a very funny person so it's a very easy read and just makes you realize like yeah everything is possible if you want to become like this expert in angular you can I mean, it also covers imposter in, uh, imposter syndrome and stuff like that. So definitely an interesting read there. And for the rest, I yeah, it's not a book, but what I really love to do is like on um, on an evening like this when the when the podcast is finished, like turn on YouTube and look up stuff like even like Tony Robbins, for instance where he just makes you think like everything that you want to achieve is possible. Like I, I didn't know that I wasn't going to be here in this podcast uh, with you a few uh, years back. I would say like, whoa, I'm very humbled that I can, that I can be here. But what I'm trying to say is like everything is possible. And maybe 
it's more important to focus on these skills, like seeing your full potential, being being happy, than saying, yeah, I have to know every single framework. I have to be the best in this or the best in that. So if I would recommend a book, I don't think it would be a technical one. Brecht, thank you. Thank you so much for this great episode. Thank you. Thank you so much. The pleasure was mine.